one of the uh, things that you mentioned in your speech was that uh, sooner or later they're going to have to uh, come out of college and uh, live with the reality of life and making a living and doing these types of things. There's enough kids in the millennial that have now come out of the colleges. How are they faring? What are they doing? I mean, they're faring poorly. They're, they're, they're shocked. I mean, they're, they're kids who are now suing their colleges. This is an actual lawsuit. Suing their colleges because they're saying, I was promised a job. I was promised an income after I come out of here. Right? The, the, the Occupy Wall Street movement was all disenchanted college kids who, who got out after that lesbian dance theory major and thought they were going to make six figures somewhere. And it turns out nobody pays to watch people theorize about lesbian dance. So, you know, the, so, the, this is, so they end up, you know, going and living in tents in, in Central Park and pooping on themselves. So it's, it's, so it's you know, it's, life is a rough teacher. What the left has tried to do is extend kind of the period of adolescence indefinitely. Right, so now you're, now you're 26 and you're on your parents' health care. Okay, by age, 20, by age 26, I'd been married for a couple of years and I was two years away from having a kid and I, you know, and I, and I already had two degrees and four published books. You know, it turns, and by the way, that, I'm, I'm, that, that's actually, I'm not even a success story if you go back 50 years, right? 50 years by the age of 26, you were supposed to be fully ensconced in your job. You're supposed to have like three kids by that point. What we've done is prolonged adolescence indefinitely. And so what Obama's goal is, what the left's goal is, what Bernie Sanders, Hillary, they have the same goal. And the same goal is to extend college out, right? College is not a place that's kind of a break from reality. College is the new reality. So we have to make all of human life like college. And this is what they think Europe is which is why Europe's is collapse. It's, Europe is going to collapse, and it's being invaded by foreign forces, and they're going, the barbarians are at the gates, and Europe is going to fall apart, and it is falling apart. So we can play this game, but it's not going to end well. Uh, so, and the problem is that because the education is so poor, instead of reacting against their teachers at college who told them everything was going to be hunky-dory, instead, instead of having the kind of all quiet on the Western Front moment, you know, where the, where the former student goes back to his classroom after World War I, he's in the middle of World War I, he goes back and he yells at his professor and he says, you're telling all these kids the wrong thing, you're telling them that war's awesome. Instead of them going back and yelling at their professors, they say, no, it just shows my professor was right because society is unjust, right? The lack of my $100,000 salary, that's because society is mean and so we have to transform the society. And, the, and that's why young people, again, 40% back speech codes in American life, this is why I think the last poll was nearing or over 40% of young people are okay with socialism, like the actual socialism, because they don't know anything. They've been taught stupidity, and how they feel is all that matters. I mean, there's a, there's a video that's going around the internet getting all sorts of play about income inequality. Income inequality is the stupidest issue. Income inequality means nothing, right? I mean, I'm, I have a lot of income inequality with Bill Gates, but I'm doing pretty well, and I don't care that Bill Gates is doing really well. The only thing we should all care about is that there are poor people. We should figure out how poor people can do better, not how to make Bill Gates less rich. But, what, but th this video is going around and saying, here's a poll of what Americans think the wealth distribution should look like, and here is what the wealth distribution actually looks like. And I watch this video in bewilderment, and young people love it. And I'm, I, I watch this video in bewilderment saying, who told you that you get to tell the universe how wealth is distributed? Right? Who told you that you have a moral say as to how wealth is distributed? It's immoral, it's evil, it's wrong. You're going to have to steal people's labor from them. But people are not told this, and so they think that their own subjective vision of what reality should look like should govern what reality actually looks like. And it's only later, after 80 years of communist failure, that they realize, oh, that, and, and hundreds of millions of people dead, that they realize, oh, that was a bad idea. Uh, you know, what I said about income inequality is a few things. Number one, the idea that the people who are very, very rich somehow stole from the people who are very, very poor, and that's why they're very, very rich is stupid. Poor people are poor and don't have lots of money to steal. Okay, so the idea that, if you, that Bill Gates got rich by ripping off a bunch of homeless people. Homeless people were not buying Microsoft, nor was he going to them, forcing Microsoft on them for them to stick into their boxes. Right? Like, that's, not how, that's not how he got rich. The way you get rich in any free-functioning economy is by participating in an enormous number of voluntary transactions that benefit both sides. You should care about the question of poverty. You shouldn't care about the question of income inequality. You should care about how do we make poor people rich, not how do we make rich people poorer so that everybody's at the same level. Because that's just you being jealous. That's just you not liking the guy's house next door because it's bigger than your house. And look at that, he has a big house, I have a smaller house, maybe I'll just go rob his place. Right? That's, not, that's not moral and it's not decent. And it's also not true. The fact is that while the left decries income inequality, the evils of capitalism, since 1994, the, the world extreme poverty rate has been sliced in half by increased capitalism 
and, and by free markets. Right? I mean, the free markets that are now being bashed left and right, those free markets are the greatest innovation in the history of humanity when it comes to the economy. It's why you have nice stuff. It's why you're not sitting in your backyard right now crafting your own handmade tie from a, from a sheep that you had to shear yourself. I mean, there's a, I thought there's a, there's a great thing. I mean, just there's a little bit of a, of, a, of a caveat on trade. I thought my favorite story of the last few months, there was some guy who decided that he wanted to make himself a BLT and see how much it costs to make the whole thing himself, right, like from scratch. So he actually went and he bought a cow and then he, and, and he, and he like, killed the cow and, and, he, and he went out and he got a pig and like he, like he went out and he did, he, he got, a, he milked and he made the cheese. He went out and he, he grew some wheat and then he milled it, right? This whole thing. It cost him $1,600 to make a BLT <laughs> and it took him six months, right? You can go down to your local restaurant and get a BLT for five bucks because of global trade and because freedom of, of, of income. And the fact is that when people talk about income inequality, what they're really saying is, they don't understand how money works. They think that if, if there's two people in a room, one person with five bucks, one person with one, the person with five stole from the person with one. It doesn't ask the question, how did the person get poor? The reality is if you don't want to be permanently poor in America, it's very, very easy. The Brookings Institute, which is a left-leaning institute, they say you only have to do three things. Graduate high school, don't have babies out of wedlock, get a job. That's it. Those are the three things. 75% of the people who do those three things will end up in the middle class. Not just not poor, in the middle class. Only 2% of people who do those three things end up permanently poor in the United States. So the idea that, there's, that it's the rich people keeping the poor people down and they're doing it for their own pleasure, their own sick pleasure. Bill Gates says, for sport, he shoots poor people from the balcony of his mansion. <laughs> it's just, it, it's asinine in every conceivable way. Uh, and, and it's so funny. I, I did a debate on National Geographic that never aired. Uh, it never aired because it was brutal. Uh, and <laughs> it was me against three, which made it almost fair for them. And it was, it was like Van Jones, and uh, I think Van Jones is on the other side, uh, and some professor from NYU, and, uh, and they, they, it was exactly on this topic. And I said to them, are you proposing that we actually just kill the rich people and redistribute their money? And they said no. And I said to them, why are you, why are you talking about the rich people? What did they do? And they didn't have an answer because they don't know what the rich people did. They just know they want their cash. <laughs> the, the idea that income inequality is correlated in any way with overall poverty is really silly. There are countries with really high income inequality and very low overall poverty. That's like the United States. There are countries with zero income inequality, Sudan, and nobody has anything. <laughs> right? So the idea that the differential is the, is the statistic that matters, it doesn't. The fact is in the United States, 9 out of 10 Americans are living above the global middle income standard. Right? Everybody in the United States is rich by global standards. And that, that, you know, you want to get rid of the income inequality by destroying that, good luck to you. Fact number one, transgender is not a disease. This is not my opinion. This is facts from the World Health Organization and the Amer American Psychology Association. Just like don't, gay people don't have a disease. Fact number two, it's not rich beautiful. kids stay rich, poor kids stay poor. It's not out, of one, out of 1,800 billionaires in the world, 12 of them are black. Where you come from, where you grow up, how much your parents earn, whether your parents are were married plays a major role in determining yeah, I know where you're there a question mark at the end. Fact number three. I would just like mark. to remind you that hate speech is not free speech. Yes, it is. And my and question is, is, since facts don't care about your feelings, why did you use false facts? Okay, so none of the facts that I used are false. First of all, yes. Uh, no, okay, first of all, uh, would you like the answer? Okay, so the, first, so the three facts you mentioned, you talked about transgenderism. First of all, until five minutes ago, the DSM specifically defined transgenderism as a disorder. It defined it as gender identity disorder, now it calls it gender dysmorphia, which doesn't even make sense. It says that depression is the actual problem, not the actual gender disorder, which again does not explain why the transgender suicide rate is upward of 40%, and the actual suicide rate for the rest of the American population is lower than 3%. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, you talked about income inequality, and you suggested that all wealth is inherited. This is nonsense. According to, according to the IRS statistics, if you are born into the bottom 20% of wage earners in the United States, you will not be one of the bottom 20% of wage earners in the United States. 90% of people will not be within 15 years. There's tremendous wage mobility in the United States of America. Plus, there is not a group of people who just sit at the very top and stay there. People move up and down, in and out of the 1%. 1% just defines the line of income it doesn't define the people who are in that 1% of income. I've been in the 1%, I've been out of the 1%. It will happen to lots of people. People who are older tend to be more likely to be in the 1%. They weren't once in the 1%, what happened? Okay, so that's number two. Number three, you say hate speech is not free speech. It depends how you define hate speech. The only speech that is not free speech is speech that overtly defends or pushes violence. 
specifically speech that is, that is generating violence, right? That's the only type of speech that's not hate speech. If I say things you don't like, that's not hate speech. And if you think that, that it is hate speech, you're a fascist. End of story. <laughs> So um, my question was about abortion, and I just wanted to know why exactly do you think a first trimester fetus has moral value? Okay, so a first trimester fetus has moral value because whether you consider it a potential human life or, an, or a full-on human life, it has more value than just a cluster of cells. If left to its natural processes, it will grow into a baby. So the real question is where do you draw the line? So you can draw the line at the heartbeat because it's very hard to draw the line at the heartbeat. There are people who are adults who are alive because of a pacemaker and they need some sort of outside force generating their heartbeat. Okay, are you gonna do it based on brain function? Okay, well what about people who are in a coma? Should we just kill them? Right, the problem is anytime you draw any line other than the inception of the child, you end up drawing a false line that can also be applied to people who are adults. So either human life has intrinsic value or it doesn't. I think we both agree that adult human life has intrinsic value. Can we start from that premise? I believe that sentience um, has, is what gives something moral value, not, okay, necessarily, so, not necessarily being a human alone. Okay, because, so, or, when you're, so when you're asleep, can I stab you? I'm still considered sentient when I'm asleep. Okay, if you are in a coma from which you may awake, can I stab you? Well then, uh, no. Yes, no, I mean, like, well, I'm glad you answered that because I have no interest in actually murdering that's, you. But that's, so, but that's still potential sentience and it's still a potential... Like, I agree, you know, like it is potential sentience. sentience. You know what okay. else is potential sentience? Being right. a fetus. The, the issue with that... Uh, the issue I have with that, though, is that um, in, if, if I'm in a coma and I'm not like doing anything to anyone, I'm not causing any issues amongst the world, whereas a, 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 an un... An unwanted child may or may not be a burden to people. Okay, well, there are be, lots of people who are unwanted, right? right? I mean, there are lots of people's parents who are unwanted, right? We're a bunch of college students. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the problem is that now, so now you're shifting the argument, right? Before you were making the argument based on the intrinsic value of a life based on sentience, and now you're talking about the level of burden that somebody presents as a separate moral argument, okay? I don't believe that you being a burden on somebody is justification for them killing you, as a general rule. I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I appreciate you and thank you. No, thanks. <laughs>